Welcome back to the Maximum Lawyer Podcast. I'm Jim Hacking. And I'm Tyson Mutrix. What's up, Jimmy? Oh, Tyson, I'm excited about today's guest. He's a good friend of ours. He's been a great member of the Guild. His name is Kevin Cheney. He's a personal injury attorney from Colorado. We love Kevin. He's been lots of fun to have uh, with us and in the Maximum Law Big Group as well. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to uh, be back and uh, pleasure seeing you guys. So, Kevin, we, we had you do your introduction, all that before, so I'm not going to do that. But tell us what's going on with you now. What's, uh, what's changed since you've been on the podcast and, and what's, uh, what's new in your world? You know, that's a great question. So I think I was on about a year and a half ago. Um, since then, I think we've hired four new employees. And um, probably the biggest change that's happened uh, is my older brother, who was kind of a silent partner in the firm. He had a law license, but didn't really practice, um, has uh, rejoined us and is going to be handling a little more of the admin and business side, um, which kind of frees up my time to uh, take up partial client load and uh, do a little bit more litigating, which I had really missed over the last few years being focused on the the business exclusively. So that's probably the uh, biggest change that happened a few months ago. I'm really excited to see how that plays out in 2024. Kevin, we wanted to have you back on the show just because there's this energy about you and an energy about your firm. I think I think people are getting excited about, and I know your team members are excited about working with you. Talk to us just a little bit about that momentum that would get somebody's big brother who had a law license he wasn't using to to pull back into the industry. Sure. So I, I really think it's it's about the culture. You know, we were really fortunate that my our firm was founded by. Um, me and my best friend from law school, Tim Galuzzi. And so we really had, I think, that energy um, from from day one. And as we grew, um, we really it was really important for us to find great cultural fits. And, and we're really blessed to just have a, a top notch um, team. I think the other thing that we do that's a little different than than most firms is rather than doing kind of individual performance bonuses um, based on employees or any type of eat what you kill model. Um, we only, besides bringing in cases, we only pay one type of bonus, which is um, we do 30% of our firm profit goes into a bonus pool, and then that gets divvied up um, on a discretionary basis to all of our employees. And I think that really has created a team-based atmosphere. It's created a lot of buy-in from you know the attorneys all the way down to the receptionist um, to really be motivated and excited about our firm. And, you know, I think that's something that uh, attracts top talent, which is always important in this day and age. Yeah, I find that interesting. Um, I'm going to stay on this topic for a second because there's some other things I want to ask you about. But the, the, specifically about that, I, Jim and I recently we were talking about, and I can't remember if it was on the Saturday show or on a podcast, but we were talking about, you know, bonuses and, and salaries and all that. And. I've been I've been sort of in this mindset where I want to shift towards I think just higher salaries, just pay people really really well salaries, and and almost scrap the bonus system completely just by paying people really really well. What are your thoughts on that, and and how did you? Because we I think right now our bonus system is probably way too complicated, um, and and now how we do things it's just a bookkeeping nightmare. So uh, I just wonder how you came to the conclusion um, of of doing the thirty percent on profit. I think which I think is a, a really simple and nice solution. Um, it, it really kind of developed over time. So you know, with personal injury work, uh, as you know, Tyson, you know, revenue and profit can be very up and down month to month or even year to year. So when we were smaller, um, you know, we were trying to pay pretty good salaries, but, you know, we certainly didn't have the revenue to compete and pay, you know, best in town by any means. But whenever we would settle a, a really big case or we had a really good month, you know, we would give each of the staff members a, a, a bonus or a small amount of money. Um, and so we were kind of doing that, but unfortunately that is not the best way to plan a business. Um, because if you're giving out all of this extra money when things are good, you may not have any extra money when things aren't as good, or you have a couple of down months. Um, and so we had a particularly good year in 2022 and we kind of looked at what we were paying as far as bonuses go. Um, and it, we looked, it was ended up being around 30%. And so we just decided to kind of adopt that as our formal plan. 
Um, but we had a lot of discussions with our team members and we basically said, look, um, we're happy to pay in kind of the upper percentile for your experience and your job position um, and basically make it all guaranteed and not do bonuses. Um, but in the personal injury space, particularly, um, you have the ability to kind of hit home runs every now and then. And I was like, you know, what I would feel bad, and, and this may be just kind of my political leanings. I'm a business owner, uh, but I, I definitely agree with a lot more of the leftists of the world politically. And I was like, I would just feel uncomfortable making seven, eight hundred thousand dollars a year and not giving bonuses to people making 40, 45, 50. You know, that just wouldn't sit well with me. And so I was like, guys, um, you know, what I would love to do, I can't legally make you guys owners of the firm because you're not lawyers, but I can essentially get to the closest thing I can as a, as a partially staff and employee owned business by essentially putting over, putting this percentage into a bonus pool. Now, the flip side of that is you don't get the reward without the risk. So in order to for this to work, we have to you know, pay more in the, the 50 percentile or kind of the middle or slightly under the middle range of salaries. So you guys have a little skin in the game, a little risk. But on the flip side, you'll then have the upside of essentially getting a share of profits. And, um, you know, I believe in the firm. I would hope you all the employees want to bet on us. And if that's true, I think this will be much more profitable for you in the long run. And it was essentially unanimous. A lot of people had a lot of questions. They asked, they, they did some math. We went through some examples. Um, but in the end, the employees basically um, were like, we'll take less guaranteed money if we have, um, you know, a percentage of the profit. And we also really are transparent with kind of a lot of the firm finances and things like that. And I think that has created a culture of buy-in. Um, and that has, has really helped people help wanting to um, volunteer to help cover people when other people are out of town, help out people who are particularly slammed, uh, either because of trials or new clients. Um, I just think it, it, it helps breed a team-based approach rather than an individual-based approach. I have two more questions on this topic, Kevin. The first one is... Let's talk about that transparency. Do, do the people just receive their bonus or do they know exactly how much the profit of the firm is for the year and, and they, they get their piece of it? So they know exactly how much revenue and expenses were and they know what the total firm profit is and then they know what the total bonus pool was. Um, they don't know unless they share it amongst themselves and we totally allow that. Um, they don't know exactly what every single person got as a bonus. No, do they know or know what every single person's salary is just because I feel like that's their information to share and not everyone feels comfortable with it. But they know, you know, this is how much revenue we did, how many clients we signed, how much money we sent on marketing. You know, this is how much we spent on rent. I mean, we kind of do a, a broad overview of all of the firm expenses because I also think that keeps people... Um, understanding that, okay, yeah, maybe we made $300,000 this month, but like running a firm is expensive. And when I was an, em an employee, I often would see, you know, us making all the revenue because that was very visible. But there were so many expenses that I feel like a lot of employees don't know about the cost of health insurance, rent, malpractice, case software. I just got my file vine bill. That was lovely. Um, you know, so I think sharing that information with employees and basically, you know, going over some basic details helps them understand that, like, you're not just hogging all of the money for yourself and that we're all we're all kind of working together to help everyone. My second question on that topic was, didn't you tell me a story about there was a situation where you guys were thinking about expanding and taking on more rent? And because the team knew that if you saved that money, that would be included in their bonus pool, that they were then more willing to sort of off, uh, share offices with each other. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's and that's the kind of a, a great example of something that I think happens at our firm on a pretty regular basis. You know, we were growing and we had a really sweet office space just right outside downtown Denver. And, you know, we were basically a lot, you know, we've been lucky. A lot of most people had an individual office or maybe two people in a really giant office. And we basically were like, look, we can rent a few more offices. This is how much it costs. Or we can, you know, add in a, a two or three more people into our existing offices and all, you know, just get a little bit closer. And they were like, wait, you know, it's going to cost us 
30 some thousand dollars a year to add on these extra offices. Let's just, you know, I can scoot over. It's fine. Um, and, and I think that's something that if we hadn't talked about expenses and we hadn't talked about the bonus pool, you know, because that's a that's a real consideration, comfort versus revenue and expenses. And it was an easy one when they were like, yeah, we'd much rather the firm make more money. Um, we're not at, we're not completely full in our current space yet. Um, but I think that's something that kind of happens on a regular basis at our firm, um, which I think is one benefit of, of kind of doing it this way. That's pretty cool. That's that, that that Jeff Bezos day one thinking that we were talking about the other day, Jim. Like that's I think that that's really cool. Um, like that's like that startup thinking almost where you're you know, everyone's kind of like working together to make sure that you know you're 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 maximizing profits, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, all right, so I want to pivot a little bit and I want to talk about the transition of your role because uh, it, that seems like a pretty massive transition and. Talk a little bit about the mindset of that and and how how things are going now with it. Sure. So I think to kind of understand the mindset now, we have to understand a little bit of kind of how we got here. Um, so, you know, traditionally when we first started out, it was just me and my partner and we were literally doing everything, you know, every staff role, every, you know, do creating all the products, signing clients, doing all the business side stuff. And over, you know, after about four years or so, when we were big enough and we kind of had some employees, um, we had a discussion about what our goals were, where we wanted to be in a year, five years, 10 years, and the kind of growth that we wanted, we really felt someone needed to be focused on the business full time. You know, I think this is something we talk about on this podcast, but also in, in, in uh, uh, Guild uh, Masterminds quite a bit is, you know, that fear of stopping doing client work to just focus on the business. And so we made that decision a few years ago and I transitioned, you know, I stopped taking new cases and basically started being the CEO and COO kind of full time. Um, and over the last few years, we've had a lot of growth. You know, I've enjoyed a lot of it. I do like running a business, um, but you know, the cool thing about being a business owner is you can kind of do whatever you want. And I realized that, that in my heart of hearts, long term like i love the courtroom i love going to trial and like that is really what i want more than anything and so you know we started having conversations about you know are we going to hire a firm administrator are we going to try to hire like a coo level you know maybe just an executive assistant and that was actually one of my topics i think at uh one of the more recent masterminds i think the the miami one and, you know, then it kind of fell into my lap that my older brother, who had been kind of giving us business advice behind the scenes for several years um, and had been working in the marijuana industry, gave me a call one day and was like, hey, I'm, I'm looking at leaving. I'm looking at going and being the number two at this legal software company. Do you know anything about them? And I was like, wait a second, you're, you're leaving the industry and you're looking to make a change. I was like, if you're interested, uh, we were about to potentially hire someone to kind of run the business side of, of CGH. Would you be interested in coming back? And, you know, he doesn't know anything about the personal injury world. He's run a lot of small businesses, so he has a ton of business experience. So it actually worked out really well because for the first couple of years, you know, he'll work under me. Um, I'll still handle the vision and kind of higher, uh, higher level, you know, issues um, while he really learns the industry. Um, but right away, he was able to take a bunch of admin work off of my plate and, and do all of that. And then after a couple of years, I think he'll kind of transition into a COO role. And we're hopeful in four or five years, he'll be able to, you know, kind of become our CEO um, and, you know, run the firm. And that's great because it allows me to kind of do an easy transition back into litigation. So I don't have a full caseload. I'd say I have about a half caseload. So probably for the next two years, I'll be doing half client work half working on the business, but then I hope to slowly increase the percentage of client work um, until one day I have maybe like an 80-20 split, I think is my overall goal. I always enjoy it when new people come into the firm and they bring their experience and their new set of eyes to the way that we do things. I'm wondering with your brother coming from business back into the law firm, what what were his initial thoughts or suggestions that he had about things that you might try doing differently? 
So one of the very first things that he realized, you know, so I, I basically had him shadow every employee for a day or two. So he was really kind of getting a full experience and um, talking to a lot of people was he felt that our processes, while we did have a bunch, especially within Filevine, he felt that we were really missing kind of a, a map of the typical case and kind of a map of everybody's roles. So um, that first month or two, he spent a ton of time kind of making flow charts. Um, his dad was in project management. We have the same mom, but his dad was, in, we have different dads. His dad was a project manager for years. And so that's really always been one of his focuses. Um, so he, he created these really cool charts to basically see the life of a case, you know, and in PI, the case bounces back and forth between like our paralegal and legal assistant a lot. Like, so it was way more complicated, I think, than he imagined from, you know, like growing and selling marijuana. It was really relatively straightforward flow chart, whereas this was a lot more complicated, but it enabled us to really be like, OK, now that we can see it, where are our holdups? Like where are cases, you know, getting stuck? And then we can really drill down into those processes. And we were able to identify a handful of things within the first month or two of him working here. Um, that really helped speed things up. And we were like, oh, this is a really important thing. Let's make that a KPI. You know, like this doesn't seem like it was important, but this one little factor, it was kind of related to something to do with medical records, is slowing down cases by a month or two. And if we can fix that and get settlements or go file lawsuits a month or two earlier, that will only increase revenue and profitability. So I think it was, I think you're exactly right, Jim. I think that fresh eyes approach of not having worked here for the last eight years allowed him to go in and be like, I can start fresh. Let's identify weaknesses and problem areas. So this is, this is timely for me. And it's, it's, um, it's interesting. So I'm going to ask you about the, a little bit about the workflows because we went, we just went through and remapped everything for our systems, and we we identified some pretty glaring gaps. I wonder what what, what gaps that you uh, you all identified, or maybe there's not gaps, but maybe some areas where you all definitely needed to improve. Because um, I think maybe that might be helpful for listeners to to identify gaps in their processes. Yeah, so two of them, I mean, we identified a handful, but I'd say two of them that immediately come to mind um, were relating to medical records. So we essentially have three different roles that are involved to some extent in medical records. We have our case managers slash prelit paralegals that were identifying with the client, you know, speaking to the client and identifying new treating providers and things like that. And essentially instructing our legal assistants to go order and get those records. And then we, the legal assistants were ordering them, but then a third person, our receptionist slash office manager, was paying the invoices and actually downloading the records. And I think that having three different people involved that all couldn't do their job until somebody else did their job was really an inefficiency, you know, because... It was so, and, and they weren't necessarily, I mean, we, they were talking on Filevine and you could obviously message each other, but there's so many medical records, as you know, I'm sure Tyson in a PI practice that even a little bit of delay magnified over all of our cases was really causing problems. And so what we did was essentially let's remove the office manager person and just have the legal assistants pay invoices and download these records because they're the ones ordering them. Um, that take that's fairly time intensive. So then we had to transfer a little bit of work from the legal assistants to our office manager receptionist person to kind of keep it balanced. Um, but that change alone has allowed us to get records. Um, we've only been doing it for a few months now, but I would say that we're averaging about five to seven days faster across our just just on that change, which, again, magnified over hundreds of cases can be a real, real benefit. Um, the other weakness we identified was when our we have one person whose whole job is intake and that person ought, sometimes would go on vacation or be out of town. And we did not have very good processes for like people would cover that role, um, but we did not have clear processes about how they were supposed to do it because they don't have the full training to essentially be the intaker. Um, but we needed them to do like 80% of it um, so that we could still try to sign those clients. 
I mean, that was a massive weakness. And really anything related to intake is so important for any law firm, because if you're not getting clients, then the rest of it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you got to have Kevin, two people. Wanna... Like, like at this point, like you got to have like really like two people that can really do the job uh, for like vacation. 2024 and goal like right there. Yeah, we'll be uh, 2024 goal is to have two full-time intakers by the end. So that's definitely something we want to do. Kevin, one of the things that I struggle with is patience. And I think it's interesting that you're taking such a slow approach with onboarding your brother and transitioning um, out of your current role into your, your future role. Talk to us a little bit about your philosophy in patience and in trying to build something to last. Oh, that's a really great question. You know, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm the most, and my wife certainly would not say that I'm not the, the most patient um, person. But I do think, especially at a, for higher level positions, right? If you're looking to hire a COO and a CEO, um, you know, you want to, they need to know the industry before they are the, going to be the ones making a decision. So, I absolutely think that like a relatively new person within a few months could, um, you know, execute a lot of plans designed by somebody who's been there longer. But if you're talking about massive decisions, like the decision to switch case management softwares, for example, that's that would be a massive decision. I, I think, Jim, you've been doing that uh, recently. Um, it's, you know, can be really rewarding, but it also can be very difficult. And a lot of things can go wrong. And so much goes into that decision about, you know, what we really want out of our software and what, we're, what our goals are and what flaws we see in our current one. And I just don't think somebody stepping into the firm for the, a month or two or even honestly six months is going to have all of the history and knowledge about what's really important there. And so, you know, we just decided it was an easier transition. Um, I also think it was good for um, learning the culture. I mean, I think my older brother shares our views and shares our culture, and he would sit on the board and meet with us occasionally. But I think you really want someone to spend some time at your firm so that they know how the firm is currently running and what's really working well so that they don't change that stuff. And they really can identify the weaknesses or kind of average things that the firm does and focus on improving, improving that. You know, so I think it was just a good transition. It also worked out well for us. My older brother had a few other side projects that he kind of wanted to, you know, finish out on and kind of see through. And so, you know, not having him work 50 plus hours every week to get started also was a benefit to him. So it was just something that kind of worked out for for us. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of nuances people that have no legal experience need to learn like like trust accounts like licensing like there's a lot like just lots of little bitty nuances that are different than a than an ordinary business um i mean there's a lot that's the same but there's a lot like that that they they still have to figure out like you can't you can't put money straight into the trust or into the operating account it's got to go into the trust account and it's got to be divvied up a certain way and all that so um i think that that's that's important i think it's smart the way you're doing it but uh we do need to wrap things up because we're almost out of time um and i want we want to be respectful of your time too I'm sure it's actually really early there. Um, so uh, thank yeah, you for joining not, us so early. But... Not necessarily in a while, but it's good. You know, I'm getting a fresh start on the day, you know, another extra hour on my, my work schedule. So no complaints. I love it. Well, I, I noticed what time we were uh, we were doing this with you. And then uh, it was you. I was like, why? I wonder why we're doing this so early with him. But uh, it's 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 good. I'm, I'm glad we we're able we to. Had, uh, but, it was uh, originally scheduled to be uh, a it was to say it's originally scheduled to be a few hours later and then I had court and then we moved it to an even later time and you had a deposition. So I think this was the only one that worked for everybody, you know, the, the life of a, a, a litigator. <laughs> nice. Well, that's, that's how it works out. But all right, well, let's wrap things up. Uh, before I do it, I want to remind everyone to if you, make sure you just join us in the in the big Facebook group. Uh, you'll get to hang out with really cool people like Kevin. But if you want more access to people like Kevin, uh, join us in the guild. Go to maxlawguild.com. Just so many great people in the guild uh, just sharing, like just brilliant minds just sharing um, a lot of their wonderful knowledge with us. So it, it's, it's fantastic to, to have you, Kevin, and a lot of other fantastic people in the guild. Uh, and then if you don't mind, if you've learned something from this episode or if you get something from the podcast, if you don't mind, give us a five-star review. We would definitely appreciate appreciate it. It helps spread, uh, spread the love to other attorneys across the country. All right, Jimmy, what is your hack of the week? 
my hack of the week, I previously recommended the book Limitless by Jim Quick, and I, I recommend people checking that book out once a year. But uh, he had a post today about prioritizing things in 2024, and I just wanted to, it was an Instagram post, and he just said, in 2024, prioritize mental health, prioritize mindfulness, prioritize whole food, prioritize connection, prioritize relaxation, prioritize hydration prioritize self-care, prioritize gratitude, prioritize outdoors, prioritize learning, prioritize exercise, prioritize reading, prioritize sleep, and prioritize you. Jim Quick gives away more good information for absolutely free. If you, if you don't have any money and you're struggling and you need, I mean, you know, we Tyson and I try to give away all of our best stuff in this podcast, in the Facebook group. Jim Quick does the same thing. Um, it's just a, a, bount, a bountiful approach to life and sharing what you know. And, and I just think Jim is someone that everyone should, should follow because, like I said, he gives away what a lot of people charge a ton of money for. And if you just listen to him, you'd be in really, really good shape. I love it. I, I don't follow Jim Quick, so I'll have to give him a follow. Uh, all right, I'm going to recommend a book that I don't think I've recommended on the podcast yet. Um, if I if if I have, I'm sorry, but I know I've talked about it in the guild. But it's 33 Strategies of War. Um, it is a it is a really good book, and it is. It, I mean, it, it's about what it sounds like it's about, but it allows you. It, it gives you little bitty tips on how to manage day to day life, like going into a difficult you know situation when you're having you know conversation with someone how to maybe address that. It is, it is, it, it gives you more, like it, it zooms in on like things like situations like that, like the one-on-one -on -one conversations, but it also kind of zooms out where you can, you know, big picture strategy sort of things. Uh, I highly recommend it. I've talked about it a lot recently, but I, it is, it is such a good book. Um, if you've not read it, read it. Um, what I did is I bought the the physical book, but then I listened to it at the same time. I, I pulled a Jim hacking on this one. Um, and so I, I, I this one especially, I think it's it's good with that one because it, it it does get some, it gets it's dense in parts, and so it's nice having the physical copy to look at it and kind of re revisit it. But um, definitely, definitely recommend it. All right, Kevin, uh, as always, wonderful uh, to get to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure being here. You gotta ask him for his tip. You forgot to ask him for my uh, my on, tip, I guess, of the of, for the podcast. Um, Oh shit! No, I'm so seriously. sorry. I did not. I was looking at the time. Yeah, Kevin. Let me let me redo that part. Gosh, damn it! I was I was like I'm looking at the time because I got the huddle at eight thirty. So I'm so sorry. All right, hold on a second. We'll we'll cut this so it makes sense. Um, all right, Kevin. All right, Kevin. Uh, so you know the routine. Uh, what is your tip or hack of the week? You know, so uh, something that I've been really working on the last few months, and, and it comes from several books. Uh, Mark Manson talks about it in The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Um, uh, in the st a lot of Stoic books on Stoicism or Buddhism talk about it. But I've been really enjoying this idea of kind of radical responsibility, which basically just means internally telling yourself that you are responsible for how you feel and everything that happens to you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're at fault for what happens or at fault for what's going on, but that every emotion you feel you're responsible for. And, you know, my wife and I had a, a lot of ups and downs and kind of a, a tragedy relatively recently, which was, you know, a really, really tough. And um, being able to take responsibility for how we were feeling has really helped been a healing and kind of cathartic thing. And so um, I think it's great for business, but also personal life of just, really understanding that you're in control of how you feel and so if you don't like how you're feeling uh you have the power to change it yeah it's it's um i, I like that and, and thanks for sharing that and sorry that you you've uh had to go through that uh recently but um but yeah thanks for sharing that and i think that that's i think that's a, a really valuable lesson thanks guys um all right so hopefully that clipped okay you bet thank you i gotta run um see you all later have a great day thanks, thanks Kevin. See you, Jimmy.